it's still connecting. Did we eat on a second? Okay, we are on, on the stage. Uh, Super. Brian, you are ready to go. So, um, hello everyone, and welcome to the Special Data Science Career Panel discussion. My name is Urania Kunadi, or Rania. I'm based at the University of Vienna, and I will be the moderator for this session. Together with me, there are also four special data scientists um, who are at a different stage in the career. They also have different interests, but some interests are also overlapping. And I think all of this will make a good recipe to have an interesting discussion that hopefully will be informative for you, will give you insights, and also we want to address some challenges with regards to this career path. <clears throat> I want to mention that your, um, uh, your participation is very welcome. So please write your comments into the um, uh, chat tab or your specific questions to the panel uh, in the Q&A tab. And I will read them through. I would not have to wait uh, for later because this is an open discussion. And without further delay, uh, because I think we are already a little bit delayed, I want to, uh, to ask um, uh, you guys to introduce yourself and uh, just tell us a little bit about where you are right now, what are your interests, and maybe where you have been before. Uh, and you can do that in the order that you prefer. Can I be the brave one and go first? because I want to test my microphone too. So. Um, so hello, everybody. I'm Anna, Anna Basili, Professor of Geospatial Data Science at the University of Glasgow. Um, but I'm at the very moment in London. Um, I live in London. I started my job during the pandemic, so that I haven't really gone to Glasgow yet, unfortunately. Um, so I um, am a chair in uh, geospatial data science, as I mentioned. Before this, I was at UCL, University College London, at the department that is called Centre for Advanced Spatial Analysis. So it's a bit confusing that it is a centre. Um, with a lot of exciting research. Um, I was a lecturer and then associate professor there. Before that, I was in Southampton, Nottingham, and Menuth in Ireland as different uh, fellow, Marie Curie fellow, um, ERC um, starting grant, and, and, and a lot of other projects. My research currently is related to um, looking at new forms of data, developing some statistical theoretical model that can actually work with the challenges that they have. And by new form of data, I mean the data that we don't collect for the sake of research, like what we did 20 years ago, something like crowdsource data, um, social media data, and so on. And they are extremely biased. I've worked with biases and missingness in data and use them as a useful information to extract information. So missingness is a kind of input for my research. So I'll um, shut up now and pass it to, let me pick one. Um, can we go with Alina? Thank you, Anna. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm Alina Rista, and I'm an assistant professor lecturer here at UCL, University College London. So see, I am presently here, and Anna was here before, but we are at different departments. So I am uh, I'm now working at the Security and Crime Science Department. Um, I'm a newly appointed lecturer. I started here in September this year. Uh, before that, I was in Boston, Massachusetts. I was working at Northeastern University. Uh, I was a post doctoral researcher there at the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs. Uh, and I am trained as a geographer and as a geoinformation person. So I did my PhD at the University of Salzburg at the Applied Geoinformatics Department. And my PhD thesis was on crime prediction using social media. So extracting different types of information from social media, like from text analysis together with location and so space and time uh, and introducing it in uh, crime prediction models. And I was focusing on sporting events. So all the crimes that happen before, during and after uh, part after sporting events in different parts of the world, like here in the UK or somewhere in the US, uh, Canada and so on. 
Um, so I was mentioning that I finished my master's and my uh, bachelor's in uh, geography, cartography, and GIS. And I did the studies back in Romania, where I am originally from. Um, at this moment, so my interests are in spatial temporal analysis of urban phenomena with a special emphasis in crime science. That is why I'm now at the crime science department, which is a very interdisciplinary department. Uh, we, are, we have colleagues from psychology, sociology, computer science and so on. So we are really a mix here and I am a geographer. So I was saying, so I'm also working on understanding crime patterns uh, for problem properties um, and uh, spatial distribution and prediction of crime around different types of crowd-based events, uh, the sporting events that I was doing for my PhD. I'm also interested so in data visualization because I did cartography on uh, my bachelor and master. So this is still an interest of, of mine, but together with this research interest, I'm interested in building an in-depth understanding between academia and the public-private sectors, um, like from the public in this case, that are working on crime with law enforcement and city municipalities and so on. Thank you. And uh, I would move on to Song. Yeah, thank you, Alina. Um... I was fortunate to actually to meet Alina and Anna in person before the pandemic. So this is a good transition. So this is Song Gao, uh, assistant professor in GI science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in the US. And my research interests mainly about using the geo geospatial data science or AI approaches to the study of human mobility and social sensing. I'm also teaching spatial data science courses at uh, UW-Madison. And before that, I got my PhD degree uh, from UC Santa Barbara. And uh, my advisor is uh, Dr. Christoph Janowicz. And it's my great pleasure to join in this session. Thank you. Now I'm passing to Xiao Jian. Hi, everyone. My name is Xiao Jian Liu. Uh, so I am a data scientist for uh, a Procter & Gamble in Greater China. Uh, I did my uh, bachelor and my master's in uh, GI science, and I studied my uh, undergraduate studies in Wuhan University, and then I uh, pursued my master's degree uh, in the Netherlands University of Twente. And uh, for my uh, previous studies, I mostly focused on spatial data science, and my current work uh, mainly involves using machine learning models for marketing purpose. Okay, thank you. Thank you guys for the deep, for the nice introduction for each one of you. Um, I, as I, maybe the audience have noticed, but I will also point it out. Uh, three of you are academics uh, and one is a recent graduate. So the first question that I would like to ask you, because I think it's important to have different opinions on that, uh, is about the quality of our educational programs. And specifically, I want to ask your opinion whether you feel uh, that we prepare sufficiently our students um, to purchase a career in special data science. Maybe, um, maybe Sam Jane, as a recent graduate, can start with that. Uh, so I think for uh, the programs in spatial data science, basically it covers uh, most of the basic knowledge for uh, students that are intended to go to like industries, like uh, like courses from uh, machine learning theories, deep learning, statistics. Uh, and uh, of course, like the, the, the program mostly focused on spatial aspects. Uh, I think it's uh, from the theoretical side, it's very, uh, uh, like uh, generally enough for students like to go to uh, pursue a job in a data scientist work. Uh, but from a like more technical side, I think uh, more uh, like coding courses and the other uh, tutorials would be more beneficial if a students really want to go to the industry. Uh, so I think that's my point from both sides on the academic side and uh, a technical side. So, yeah. Uh, thank you. I'm not, um, I don't know if anyone else uh, would like to add something here as teachers. Yeah, so I would, I would add that 
it's different in different countries, right? So I live on different continents and they yeah, are different countries, different cities. Um, and I think that the programs are, yeah, are, are very variable um, in uh, in geography or in, um, you know, because practically for spatial data science, we are talking now about spatial data science, but there are some programs that, for example, there is the urban geoinformatics at Northeastern that actually they are doing a lot of spatial data science. There is geography back home in Romania, the GIS group, let's say. Um, so so I think, I think it's different. I think uh, when I was doing my studies, for example, and also now from what I hear from my colleagues, we, I feel like we do not have enough Again, this is for, for Eastern Europe or an Eastern Europe opinion. Um, I feel that we do not have enough technicalities introduced there. While for me moving on the Western world, I noticed that in the programs there are there is a lot of more programming, more databases, more math, more stats, you know, what you need to further develop for this type of career in spatial data science. Uh, and that's something that I I was missing. Uh, I was missing back home, and I'm sure that there, so I'm the example of Romania, but I'm sure that there are other countries uh, where the programs do not include enough technicalities that are needed. Also, something is that I would point out, so besides being technical and so on, I think nowadays there are also a lot of problems with privacy and ethics that should be more tackled um, at, uh, at the university um, than, um, than, what, what, than what I know is done by now but again i'm talking about my experience so maybe my colleagues can can share from other experiences yeah in addition to what uh Xiaojian and alina said i uh, also add the inter institutional difference because different institutes they place the spatial data science education in different departments for example in our university it's like uh involve uh, data uh, involve computer sciences statistics and also for spatial data science involve geography and environmental studies and but in another institute such as uh uc san diego it's actually housed in you know data science and add the gs or geospatial component so those this is why uh, those educational programs regarding the syllabus design curriculum are a little bit different so um talking about that i think that uh, uh, those, you know, fundamentals and then the related technical courses uh, might also be uh, slightly different. But uh, I agree if we decompose the spatial data science, we have a geospatial thinking component. We also uh, need to be competent in the data science side. So that is, uh, we, uh, we should have both aspects. I feel I need to say something, but to be honest, everything that I wanted to say is already covered. So um, I just echo, um, if we consider data science as those three bubbles of statistic, computing and domain knowledge, you know, depending on where you are, for example, in the UK, master courses mostly cover data science and spatial data science and they're one year. So they need to choose really what exactly they want to teach. And um, there are some areas to cover, for example, Alina said ethics um, is one of them, but certainly there, sh there should be some core courses related to statistics, uh, programming, and of course, some of the um, a bit more applied sort of aspect of data science, which I think we are doing a fair job there. I'm happy with that, but to be honest. Uh, guys, I also added here a comment by Jano. I'm not sure if he will prefer to comment on his comment <laughs> because it shows a different perspective for which, I mean, I believe you can all see it. Uh, it from my point of view, this is really, uh, I agree with that point uh, because the truth is that the, at the university, we need to, to teach the foundations and all of us who are doing technical courses, we know and we face the difficult, difficulty of how often we have to revise and change and have unpredicted things happening because technolo technology changes. So I think we don't have to be really harsh on the technical needs. Uh, so yes, that's why I posted this comment here, but uh, I believe we can move on. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, I think I just wanted to emphasize on this comment, yeah, no, and that's why I, I posted here on the stage. Uh, but I guess we can move on. 
yes, foundation. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's just wanted to mention uh, one thing. Yesterday we had a very good interview in this uh, event, and there was a very good emphasis on start from the beginning, and I'm entirely happy with that. So um, I, I'm not saying that we should move towards too technical, but but if you know the correct way of doing things even technically that 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 means you're much faster in a lot of other things sure that's true uh, could we also talk perhaps a little bit until until i see more questions uh, popping out um, and perhaps highlighting some application domains maybe for me it will be more interesting to see what you can share from your work experience, where we can learn how spatial data science uh, is a, plays a key role at certain domains, from your experience, of course. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, like for uh, from my uh, from the perspective of my work, actually, we have one. Uh, like a uh, project that involves uh, uh, certain spatial data. Uh, actually, uh, from the industry side, uh, most of the uh, most of the companies are now uh, growing their uh, are, are becoming more interested in uh, spatial data, but they are only like uh, trying to get into this field. Like so, most of the companies are starting to collecting the data and trying to do some basic analysis based on the spatial data sites. Uh, so uh, currently the spatial, uh, regarding with the spatial uh, data analysis methods or even further spatial data science uh, uh, methods. Now, I currently didn't see any like uh, uh, usage in depth for uh, in the business, but definitely I, I have observed that, that there is a trend of uh, uh, of the companies that are trying to uh, incorporate the spatial side into their their uh, their business model. So okay, uh, maybe... I would like to. Uh, sorry, Shadia. No problem. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I I would like to add the uh, Sen Xiaojian mentioned about the you know the business intelligence side. Uh, so our research lab uh, did collaborate with two you know, companies. Uh, one is in more in the traditional, you know, store chain business, like a location business. Another is more in the telematics insurance industry. So for this uh, two types of uh, you know, application domains, they have a different needs, but both of them require, you know, core spatial thinking and uh, data science knowledge. For example. Uh, in the traditional chain store selection problem, and they need to understand the geography of the potential, you know, region and the location. You know, re you know, they want to know like the population distribution, the age, the income distribution, different neighborhoods. They also want to know the competitors' location, and then they run some of the you know uh, business competition model and do some prediction. And in another domain, um, you know, in the telematics insurance industry, uh, they need to analyze a lot of you know, mobile phone device data and also in-car sensor data. And because those data definitely are imagine, they come from uh, you know, moving objects. Uh, they need a lot of trajectory data analysis. And this definitely uh, one part of, of the core application, I think, uh, in the spatial data science. And yeah, these two are uh, real world examples or applications. Uh, that our uh, group has been involved. Prania, can I add one little thing to this? Um, yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I think. Can I listen also? Funny. Sorry. <laughs> but you can both. Both of you, you can, and you, 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 of course, you cannot. Okay, great. I don't get permission. Um, I think sometimes um, spatial is really the main problem the problem is a spatial and for that you know without a spatial thinking you can't really solve the problem for example the the examples of i don't know we had covid and we know this is going to be very spatial how disease develop and you know the location develop delivery of a lot of uh, resources and so on sometimes uh the spatial thinking could help to set a 
context to solve other problems that aren't necessarily data spatial, but solve better if we consider the, the periphery of that. So um, I think we believe a spatial is a special for first reason, basically. Uh, for example, you can't really uh, deal with privacy concerns around location and tracking without spatial thinking. It's practically impossible. Um, but, but there are some sort of problem that you can think of that, you know, yes, you can answer that, but location certainly help. So among all of the examples that um, have been for provided so far, I, I think most of them are genuinely uh, the spatial problem. I'm sure Alina can give us very good example from um, crime-related science, but the, again, that that's going to be a very spatial problem. But I, I as a person into geospatial data science, I, I, I think of any problem spatial, and perhaps it's a bit of my own bias, but I cannot really think of anything. I, I would challenge the audience to think of a thing that is not really a spatial problem or uh, spatial thinking cannot really help at all maybe entirely philosophical uh, yeah. be before i move on before i moved on to alina i mean of course i agree with you and i believe that everybody here will agree uh, at least mostly uh, uh, because apart from the application domains i see that we are also discussing uh, the the fact that special problem exists in most of the examples. I also would like uh, Alina that will, uh, wanted to add something, but also maybe you, Anna, uh, in addition to what you have to say, also, uh, I don't know if you've seen this comment from Peter Kedron, because I think it's relevant to what we are discussing. Uh, also have a look at this comment. Alina, sorry. And then, yeah, you can say what you have in your mind. So I go first and then Anna can uh, can discuss about uh, the comment. Did you hear me? Uh, yes, I mean, I wanted, uh, I didn't want to interrupt you before you start and I, I share your opinion, but also have a look at the at this comment because I think it's relevant. We well, just lost the comment if you can put it back there. And yes, ah, I'll okay. give some examples. So, um, so yeah, from my point, definitely, I am working with uh, spatial temporal data from uh, the law enforcement, and um, we are, you know, everything is in space, right? And I'm doing crime forecasting, so in space and time, which type of crimes are occurring, uh, which type of additional data sets that are also dynamics in space and time can be used. So also, all my thinking is always in space and time. Um, however, sometimes, you know, uh, you also need to use some other's opinions from uh, the sociology point of view or the psychology point of view or so on in crime analysis in order to understand some behaviors. So I always tend to work with uh, with people that are complementing my knowledge in the spatial temporal side. Um, and I would give another um, two, two other short, very short examples. Um, one of them would be from um, a project that I had with the emergency services in Boston. Uh, so they have all the data. Um, let's say one of the one of the parts of the project was uh, with ambulances. You know, which how many ambulances um, started in the morning, how many were in the afternoon, the evening, and so on. So then we were discussing a lot about data visualization in space and time of how to see where there are you know more emergencies, which type of emergency how the, the time period on which an ambulance answered from one part to another. And we helped them create different reports on that. So then is another way of using spatial data science in one another, another application and working with the municipality and uh, helping them with, with their reporting. So also um, this, this would be a case or another case from uh, the law department when um, I was working with them on schools for kids with disabilities and and uh, from kids from low income um, families, because they were uh, discussing about the pipeline, the cradle to prison pipeline. So how these kids will can be more, if they would be more involved or more vulnerable to different crime types in the future. So then it will be a combination of so many variables and from all the schools in a state or um, in a country with different characteristics of the kids, but also the neighborhoods effects and so on. So there are very complex problems that can be tackled with spatial data science, but also according to the ones that need this information, we also need to know how to 
provide it, how to present it. Uh, I think that's also important when working with different stakeholders um, outside the academia. So it's a way that we talk in academia, a way that we talk in the private sector, a way that we talk in the public sector. So presenting the presentation part is also important, I think. Um, okay, Rania, going back to Peter's comment that you posted, I, I, I cannot really agree more. I, I, I am in entire agreement, but I just wanted to add something that he mentioned, and I think that's a very important point, that location usually acts as like a foreign key to many different discipline and data sets. And um, for example, if you're working with, I don't know, economists and then health related, you know, because location is there everywhere it's the the unity and ubiquity of location um you always can actually link all the other disciplines and have a proper multidisciplinarity so understanding how and when and where of course things happen is very crucial to to understanding the whole dynamic of the society and the city and you know everywhere else so so i think that's a very important point even if it's not a spatial by nature a spatiality helps to link a lot of um, additional information um, and solve the problem much better. So, yeah. True. I mean, space is the lurking variable, right? Uh, depending on whether you support some methods or not, but it's a different discussion. So if space is lurking variable and we had this discussion so far, maybe all of your whoever prefers could um, um, uh, why don't you tell us from the point of view of what you specifically do in your work or in your research, what can a special data scientist bring as an added value to a typical data, sci uh, data scientist position? I feel I, I talk too much. Shut me up if I, uh, but I, I'm very happy to go first because I, I don't want anyone to steal this one. Um, I think a lot of um, methods, theories that are developed in other disciplines are based on a lot of assumptions that may or may not be valid in geography. You know, the, the, the basic example is, for example, in a statistics, we work with IID valid data a lot of time, or we assume that they are ident identifiable, they're identical, they're not highly correlated. This is just against the first law of geography that we assume everything that is closer to other things are more similar and, and, and so on. Um, so adjustment based on what we know from geography is definitely um, required. And um, well, yesterday we, we somehow disregarded GWR, but I really wanted to use that example that how we um, adopted a kind of a spatial thinking to reframe a relatively widely used method, which is basically regression, for a problem that is by nature spatial. And we realize that, okay, what when we mean, for example, the residuals are um, in this form, that means this is a spatial problem and you need to consider the interdisciplinarity and dependency of the data. So I think um, this is the best example I, I always use, um, that GWR, for example, improved regression for the problem that are genuinely a spatial. Yeah, I also uh, I agree with Anna. I also want to add that you know in the domain of geo AI, uh, because of the spatial heterogeneity of the you know phenomenon or the problem you are solving, and there is no one you know one model fits all. You know this is why we want to develop spatially explicit AI models to address the heterogeneity issues. So this is also you know why you know spatial play a uh, important role in general uh, machine learning problems. And I think uh, uh, I do want to uh, help or just uh, share my thoughts about one question posted in the chat box um, that also related. Uh, I think Hong Yu from McGill University talking about uh, how would the educators help students ready when they try finding their first jobs. Unfortunately, recruiters do not list GIS foundations in job descriptions. So. You know, which is true, and they may only list, okay, maybe a knowledge of GIS, um, maybe is 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 uh, encouraged, but uh, maybe not required, and I think that is, um, you know, that's a fact. However, I do want to mention, yeah, I do want to mention that, you know, um, depending on really what kind of 
you know, industry <laughs> you want to enter into, if it is more related to the traditional, you know, a spatial, you know, data science jobs or data engineering, or maybe that's tailored to the spatial data science domain. However, in either case, uh, as previous panelists mentioned, uh, it's really hard to, uh, you know, think, um, you know, uh, any domain that don't need uh, some spatial thinking when, you know, they relate to any phenomenon, you know, on the, on the, on the earth. Yeah, actually, I want to add something because there are many questions popping up. Like, uh, actually, I think most of the questions are linked together because from the spatial thinking that we have to discuss and from the, the job requirements, actually, I think, uh, as Anna has mentioned, the spatial thinking and the, the spatial foundation is a, is a core of, is, a, is very crucial for uh, the, the program. Actually, from my experience, like most of the uh, the business or the companies, actually they didn't realize a, a problem can actually be a spatial problem. That's I think what I think is the added value from a uh, a, 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 a employee or uh, a worker from a, a spatial background. That uh, is your uh, actually your uh, time to show up that you can actually turn their uh, mindset into a spatial way. So, and for uh, the job market, actually, uh, the home you has asked, uh, I think for, if you are aiming for a, a, a spatial uh, part, uh, direction, actually, I think that uh, if you are talking about the spatial uh, work that you have done together with some machine learning works, actually, the, uh, the recruiters are very interested in this side because they are actually not very familiar with that. And I, from my experience, actually, uh, many of the the the, uh, the bosses or the recruiters there they show a great interest in your work and your background. So I think it's a great added value during your job interview or the other uh, sessions. And for another question that's popping up in the Q and A part, uh, I would say like it asks the uh, the ratio of the skills. I would say six, uh, sixty percent uh, because. Uh, most of the uh, my job involves like a spatial side, but definitely, as I mentioned before, uh, the, the skills that you have learned from your uh, uh, data science program actually covers the basics. So basically, you can transfer this uh, this like uh, skills into your actual work. Uh, yeah, that's all from my side. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Sean Jane and Sean, for also noting on the questions that I neglected. <laughs> I, I hope because I brought uh, Hong uh, Gu, sorry for mispronouncing your name, on stage. I hope your answer, your question was answered. I'm not sure if there is um, something more you would like to add or ask. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. My question has been answered. I think the takeaway from our panelists is that depending on the, the field of work uh, you're trying to searching for, that there may be recruiters that are very interested in uh, people that have a geospatial background. Um, but I still do think that as educators in higher education, we should teach the students the latest technologies as well, in addition to those, those foundations that's already included in the curriculum. Yeah, but thank you. Thanks, I think we, we all agree with your last comment. Um, okay, uh, <clears throat> uh, I don't see any further question. I'm not sure if I missed something, uh, but uh, another thing that, uh, and I'm not sure if we have a lot of time, maybe that will be the last uh, point to discuss. Uh, in my view, not everything is perfect. Uh, uh, and we we are talking about special data science, the fast growing landscape of data science, both in academia as well as, as well as in the job market. Uh, we know that there is a trend, and I'm wondering whether you you also may believe the same like me uh, that this is a sometimes an opportunistic trend. Uh, if not, generally, I would like to ask your opinion whether you think that there are any problems or flaws with regards to this increasing trend towards a, this specific career path. Uh, 
Anna, don't be shy. We'd like to hear your voice again. I am very shy, as you know me. Um, um, well, I, well, job market basically mandates who teach what and um, basically, I mean, who goes to what program in, in a very significant way. And job market is driven by the demand to the society impact that we want to make. And um, I wouldn't necessarily say this is a kind of a um, hype that, you know, that disappears in a few years. Um, we teach the student as best as we can fundamentals. And of course, um, the technical bit, we, we teach them fundamental to make sure that they don't do wrong thing, that that's the purpose. And the, um, the advanced technicality is to do them right. So um, whatever they learn. And I think, um, yes, it's not perfect, but I, I, I always quote that George Box's uh, famous quote that says, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. So yes, of course, yeah, we want to develop something. Um, we know that nothing is going to be perfect, but they're going to be useful in some sense. So having more people in this discipline with more spatial thinking, with more knowledge of basics, added by the, um, the techniques and the ethics that they require will help society to understand them. Remember, we are moving in industry four time, big data time, what, whatever you want to call it. Even policies of the government are data driven. We, you know, we never thought our prime minister and the president in the US come and talk between of the two scientists backing whatever is the new policy about lockdown. So we are really based on data. At least we hope that um, data centric society uh, drives uh, what we decide. So anything related to data science, I think is a useful way towards that direction. Of course, we need um, non, and by data, I don't mean just quantitative data, qualitative research also um, required um, a lot. But I'm, I'm just trying to say that if you understand how to analyze this as a part of the courses or, you know, your job, that's a useful thing towards that direction of industry for or, I don't know, data centric society. So I would say that um, it's also so now we say we're talking about spatial data science, right? Some years ago, we were calling Geoinformatics. You can be a GIS technician, a GIS engineer, um, and something about GIS. So I feel like we we evolve. If we look at the past years and all the the terminologies, and it's like now we call big data, then we call smart cities, and then so there are all 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 these type of terms that we are using. That finally some of them some of them are actually similar or the same. But we are just uh, we are just changing them. Um, but about the spatial data science, I think, so at least from my students, you see, so some, some students are very interested in the technical part because they want to work in companies. So they know very well what they want to do. And we know that companies in general, also when I worked outside academia, they they are interested in what you know algorithmically. Of course, it's very good and it's important to know the foundations because if not you are so without foundations you are just running some uh, i don't know you get a code from the internet and you run it let's say you have a prediction code and you don't understand what is happening there because you don't have the fundamental understanding of the spatial component or any component so fundamentals for example now i'm teaching fundamentals of crime science maybe some students are bored but they are the fundamentals because you need to build over them because if not you cannot just go and just I mean, you can, but you would do it wrong, most probably. Um, so I, I totally agree with uh, with having the foundations and then you add um, you add over them. But when the students are coming, so I'm talking now from the academic point, they are coming with the idea. I just I just want to learn. I just want to to do the technical part. I think us as a, as teachers, as lecturers, we we should also explain them why it's important to always have both sides and not only the technical side. Um, so that's something also as maybe maybe in a first course when when you ask them what do you want to do or they are very sure or they are not very sure what they want to do um, in spatial data science for them to understand that is there are many components that are important and they need to go through all of them even if they want to be in academia they want to do their phd they want to go to industry there is a process and then they can select later on um what is more what will be uh, um, better 
for them and, and so on. And there are some people that, sorry, some students um, that would go more into the technical side, more that want to stay in research and do theories, right? And do more theoretical work. And that is totally fine. We need also people who uh, work on theories, people who work more um, on, on uh, uh, different modeling. So uh, this is why we are different types of researchers, uh, different, you know, um, in order for all of us to collaborate. I think collaboration is actually something that I, I didn't mention yet, but I think collaboration and interdisciplinarity or multidisciplinarity is highly important in this field. And we are all coming together to, to get something, something well done that is accurate and always um, you know, something else in special data science that we need to always talk, you know, I mentioned again about ethics and limitations that I feel they are important and maybe we're not always discussing them as much as uh, we could. Sorry, that's my long. No, thank you. Ali. Mark. I think, okay, song one. So I'm muting myself. Oh, thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, I will continue the story, but also linking to what uh, Yano asked uh, in the in the chat box about the you know the PhD thesis topic because this also relate to the you know future spatial data science opportunities. And from my understanding, I think that generally uh, there are two pa pathways to you know to pick a PhD topic. Uh, one pathway is more from the traditions, you know, in GI science on geography. So that is more around the, you know, theoretical contributions. Another pathway I would call, you know, we select a topic from the use inspired science. So more specifically, uh, for example, recently, actually my two PhD students, they also, you know, in this process, selecting, you know, Thursday topics, because um, in the past one or two years, they have been involved in two different application domains so, but, uh, you know, PhD sources is not, is not just about applications for sure. So we want to advance the domain. So this is why we, um, you know, ask them to, you know, to extract what are their, you know, grand challenges in this specific domain. What are their fundamental, you know, research questions that, you know, you can extract from those use inspired science problems. And then uh, we can utilize um, if needed, you know, I, we still want to perform the state of the art review. And then, if needed, they may want to bring maybe advances in the spatial data science field or geo AI field to solve the problem. So, I think uh, uh, this is just my limited understanding uh, about the two possible pathways uh, for you know, picking a, a topic in this area. Thanks a long a lot, uh, Sound Jane. Yes, please. Yeah, actually, uh, we are talking about like theory, uh, like technical as as well as uh, Song has mentioned that the different directions, uh, especially for students that are going to their PhDs. Actually, I think all the directions, uh, actually they are mixed together, not one one the other. Like they are not like uh, if you choose this one, you cannot get the other one as well. Like all the things like GIS in in essence is a interdisciplinary like uh like study, right? So I, I would say like technical part and the theoretical part, they're actually mixed together. You have to do both. Like especially if if you are going to business world, like if you have as just as uh, Anna has mentioned in the chat box, like you have to have a framework or have a have a like kind of mindset to guide you through uh, uh, into solving different problems. Actually, the models, if you are only uh, interesting like different models without any like uh, spatial mindsets, actually they, they may lead to another wrong direction. I think you have uh, for students that are intended to success both in both academia or business world, they have to like uh, uh, learn from both sides, not actually one the other. Yeah, I, that's that's my point. Like all the things actually are linked together. We cannot like separate the completely. 
Uh, Anna, uh, is this comment uh, on the novel model, blah, 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 related to that, that you'd like to add something? Uh, should we know more about the blah, blah model? Um, no, it, it is um, something like editorial that I wrote. Um, I don't want to go through the story. It is all there. Um, it's sometimes it is too easy to implement a model just because it is accessible. It's not like 20 years ago to code um on those cards and you know it is much easier and and sometimes we just pick a, a model use it for the data that is abundantly available we, we are in the time that data is everywhere and we are droning in data and we get some good result that doesn't mean that's a proper research that that just you know playing with the tool and using a new model with some data that is available is very risky to the whole science because one day coffee can kill you the other day coffee can cure your cancer and that that's the whole uh, problem with um, some of the things that we see in the papers and i see a lot of people hating that coffee um but, but well that's also because of other things that i think is uh, very linked to a comment um, that i saw um, about the public communication i think um in that editorial i was trying to say that first of all we shouldn't just do the research because some data is available because there is a risk of um, looking for answer where it is possible to get um, so um, there is a section on uh, on that editorial about that um, so with a bit of funny story about a person looking for their key just under the light because the light is there not because they lost the key there um, but also the model should be justified you know that's where foundation comes and play um, just because you get better accuracy I don't know 95% accuracy versus 85 doesn't necessarily mean that's the right answer that's a better answer that might be just wrong with very large data set you can find any correlation between anything practically it, it's the whole problem with a lot of data um, and I think um, that that's the part of that editorial that I put um, so I just wanted to add one thing because uh, it was mentioned about the um, um, the public um, element. One of the things that I wish we learned in at the time that we were in at the university, um, if you, especially if you're studying or doing some PhD and some postgrad, um, you know, sort of courses. Um, was communicating your research with public in addition to ethics that we think that I think we don't teach enough to data scientists. Uh, public communication is not there too. So, so that element of communicating your result to public, uh, which increase the impact is also missing, um, that benefit the society. Yeah, I think that that's amazing. It's not exactly the answer to this question, to be honest. Uh, but I think um, that's very I, well linked to that. I added it here, uh, uh, Anna, because I think that maybe you or somebody else then can link to this discussion to this question. Yeah, exactly. I was referring to this very comment um, that um, I think sometimes there is a blue sky research that doesn't necessarily translate to something that people, you know, my next door neighbor Marjorie can understand it. That's fine. As long as it is going to help science in a maybe longer term, impact doesn't happen tomorrow. Impact happen in 20 years time, sometimes even in 100 years time. I think there is always a balance, both in terms of, you know, what I should apply for, for funding or do my research and so on. Um, between blue sky research, something that is, you know, very long term, maybe not necessarily in my lifetime impactful, and something that actually serves the society directly. And I think um, the way that data science and spatial data science is designed is the fantastic opportunity that we can actually do both as much as we want, because we are not like, um, maybe that's much difficult if you're a mathematician, um, if you're a physicist, it's much harder to do something that people on the street actually sense the difference when you do it right. Uh, but for a spatial data scientist, it is possible to make a balance. So I think that that's a very important question. Nobody still knows the answer of what should be the best balance. Should I apply for blue sky research? 50% of my research should be that academic curiosity or um, public impactful research. We don't know exactly, but the good part about our discipline is we can do both. That That's the best part. 
So yeah, I think um, my comments uh, can be linked uh, to this, but in a very different way. I wanted to say that as a scientist, if I do something impactful, I should link it and translate it to the society to prevent misinformation, disinformation. You know, we live in the time of Twitter with 140 character. We need celebrity scientists way more than we have now. And I hope we train our students and researcher in PhD and you know master degrees to be able to translate their knowledge into the, the language of people on the street. Uh, thank you so much, Anna, uh, for answering the previous question. Uh, I, I, there are also more questions popping out. So I'm having here this one by Link Kai. I'm not sure if she also wants to join uh, our discussion. Oh, she's here. Yeah, so I'm just curious, uh, how could we ensure the quality of re reviews? Because we may have some new master from machine learning uh, community, and we also want to want to do some traditional or want to evaluate the traditional method or traditional thinking. So probably we need both sides uh, from the traditional or theoretical geographer, or we may also have some uh, people have experiencing in machine learning. But I found that it quite difficult uh, or how, how, how could you think we should guarantee the quality of the uh, reviewers? Yeah, thank you, Lin. This is a great question. Um, so <laughs> I think Anna can also add more comments since he is an editor. <laughs> and for me, I think that this definitely call for more dialogues from the organization perspective. This is not an individual role, I think that, uh, uh, but I do think that uh, as a, you know, if you uh, serve as an editor board or editors for journals, I think that if you, you know, fund a submission that's, you know, uh, relevant to what you call those, you know, interdisciplinary or just the, in one specific topic and you want to shoot the diversity, you may want to invite the reviews uh, from, you know, related domain, not just the one. So maybe one focus more on technological side, but maybe another one or two focused on maybe the domain side or more critical side. Um, I think that's actually a very good uh, suggestion, you know, to the community. Uh, for me, for example, I I serve as an editor board for two interdisciplinary journals. Uh, one is uh, a scientific reports so under Nature Springer, another plus one. So they are actually multidisciplinary journals. Whenever I receive a submission, and I will, you know, consider the reviewers from multiple domains, so not just the one. So actually, I think individual uh, academic editors uh, can definitely push this side. Thank you. That's my uh, point. I totally agree with Song. So I would say also when um, I've been guest editor, um, what I'm doing is I am checking which researchers to choose according to the topic of the paper, but for the researchers to have different backgrounds. So for example, um, you're mentioning link here about the machine learning and traditional methods. I would be checking uh, people who have experience in those type of methods that you are using, but also in the traditional side and also what you write in the paper that would fit the interest of other researchers that have experience. So then when you get, I don't know, three reviewers or four reviewers and they all are specialists on certain parts, then can give um, they can give their opinions and then you can have some uh, um, you can have some complementary um, and additional information from from all of them. Because, for example, or if someone is asking me to review a paper and there is part of the paper i don't know they are using something that i'm not familiar with uh, i cannot review it and say this is good or wrong because it's not something that i'm a specialist about but i hope that the other reviewers for the same paper are specialists on that bit that is not my bit so this is why it's important to choose the reviewers that would would have all the bits together so then you would have a fair review at the end from people who really understand uh, your paper and I would say well I guess we're not going into the discussion of predatory journals or so on um, but I would just mention that sometimes this fairness that I was saying and about people that really know what they are doing when they are reviewing um, 
sometimes it's not working like that. Sometimes you can get some reviewers that are not um, well, or you can, yeah, uh, at some predatory journals, uh, let's say they can, they can choose some reviewers that are not really specialists and they are reviewing like three lines and you get the review that is three lines and is accepted or I don't know what. And I'm sure that here people, maybe you can discuss more, uh, my colleagues. Uh, and then it's like, it's a paper that is accepted after a three lines review that doesn't make so much sense, but this can happen, unfortunately. And I'm talking about predatory journals and about also some of my uh, past um, experiences. So, um, yeah, we need to pay attention on that, but I guess that that is another discussion to move Can on. Can I just add one thing to this? Um, in theory, yes, all works, but if I wear my hat as the editor in chief, I would say the whole system is a bit flawed. Um, you know, we expect... Yeah. We are reviewers. Just make it absolutely clear that reviewers do, do not come from Mars. We are. We submit and we review. And we, when we are author, we say, oh, reviewers are rubbish. And when we are reviewer, we say papers are rubbish. Um, and, and the reason for that is because the system is a bit, uh, well, not a bit, really badly structured. We don't pay reviewers to review. Uh, they don't get any credit and uh, recognition. I'm sorry. I apologize for that. Um, and um, nobody gets the credit and I apologize for this. Um, nobody gets credit as a reviewer. And that means um, all the credit goes if the, it is a published paper to authors and their journals. Um, and that's not great because you may decline because you are busy. Your workload model doesn't co uh, consider this. I apologize, really. I, I don't know what is going on here. It's just a missed call. Um, so the, the, the problem, as I said, is because the system needs to slightly be different. Open source is potentially open science uh, peer review process within before the submission is something that we can do uh, preprint. Some of these are helpful. But none of them are the answer. I think the whole system needs to be slightly different. Um, as the editor, I send it to five, 10 uh, reviewers. But when it comes to the review, they all are busy. And because they don't get any credit and it's not in their workload model, they may decline. And you know, it, it never works. In the best case scenario, when I see three lines of review, I just return back and ask. But as the author, I would suggest go and talk to the editor when you see these sort of comments comes in. We always welcome these sort of suggestions and uh, comments from the author, not, not because it is your paper, fundamental, based on principle, this is wrong to do this. So um, yeah, I, I think that that's one thing. I wanted to comment on another question, if that's okay, Rania. Well, I'm wondering, you know, for me it's totally okay, but I, I think the, the schedule is kind of tight. And okay. You know, more or less, we discussed uh, everything. I also have the feeling, uh, let me see the background info that I get that you cannot see it. Uh, yes, maybe we can move to the lounge and uh, because there are maybe one or two questions that we didn't have time to cover. Uh, I really want to thank you all uh, for this fruitful discussion. I hope you also enjoy it. And maybe I will see you in the next sessions. Bye bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Bye.